So good evening everybody. Welcome to the Science Party meeting for August. But this being part of National Science Week, we have a special event for you tonight. Uh, we'll be celebrating Australian science and discussing the politics around its funding. So my name is Aaron Hammond and I'll be your MC for the evening. Last month I was in Perth running for the federal election, federal by-election. And while it was clear that when people heard about a rational, sensible uh, party, they were excited. But what really excited them were our, our bold vision for hope in the future. And that's what we do. We aim high with an optimistic uh, spirit and tackle great challenges. Great challenges that we call moonshots. As Randall Munro says, shoot for the moon. If you miss, shoot again. Keep shooting and never stop. So tonight we'll have a few discussions. Uh, we'll start in somewhat chronological order. There we go. Uh, we'll start off with Tom Gordon, uh, who's going to do a bit of a retrospective, looking at our past successes. Andrea Leong discussing the current state of science funding. And James Jansen looking to the future. So to kick things off, Tom has put his cabaret career on hold briefly to give us some history. Uh, Tom, Tom Gordon studied astrophysics the international space industry and science communication and is currently undertaking a PhD in physics education research. He's been a high school student and teacher and a policy officer at the National Measurements Inst Institute and he's currently the senior science communicator at the School of Physics at the University of Sydney. Tom, Tom ran in the last federal election in the seat of Watson and he's here tonight to talk about outcomes of the Australian science and innovation. Welcome Tom. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, so I'll, I'll be um, really quick because you mostly know all of this, uh, all of this stuff. But I want to run through a few uh, successes from Australian innovation and science funding. Uh, again, you're going to know most of this and there's heaps of stuff I've missed out, but I'll, I'll be nice and quick. The first one I wanted to mention is David Unipen. David Unipen, he's the guy on the fifty dollar note, obviously, and he invented this thing here, which is the mechanical shearing a shearer for shearing sheep. We still use versions of that today. David Unipen was a prolific inventor, a prolific uh, indigenous scientist. He invented or had over 90, 19 um, provisional patents, and some that were. Uh, more sketches than paint, uh, patents, but he invented things like the mechanical shearer. Also, he tried to invent a perpetual motion machine unsuccessfully. He tried to invent um, also a, a helicopter based on the design of a boomerang, which I think is really cool. Uh, the point is uh, that he is an Australian inventor and scientist. He used the same process as we do. Um, but it's a bit of a, a weird start because there w he didn't have much funding. Uh, one of my science heroes is Ruby Payne Scott. She was one of the first people to uh, help develop the technology of radar, which really helped out in, uh, in uh, the world wars, right? Detecting, detecting things where they shouldn't be and, and uh, not having... Uh, one of my favourite stories... Sorry, one of my favourite stories about radar is that they tried to keep it a secret, you all know this again, they tried to keep it a secret so they made up the lie that you eat carrots therefore you can see at night. So all the Germans started eating carrots and that didn't work. But this is a real success of Australian innovation and Australian science. Another success is Woomera, uh, although we wouldn't call that a success now. This place used to be the heart of space research around the world, or one of the, the first places of uh, uh, space research around the world. Uh, this is a, a launch pad at Woomera. In its heyday, it's about to launch uh, a massive big test rocket for the European Space Agency. It's, it's a desolate landscape now. It, there's nothing there. That's still there and it's huge, but there's nothing there. Uh, they, they, st they still run some test rockets uh, in a place near there um, for uh, university students, uh, but these are very, very low funded uh, low funded things. The point is we once had a huge part of it because we were putting funding there. Australia has a massive part in the international space, uh, international space race because of our commitment to funding. This falls down of course when you have um, uh, you know, 
forward-thinking governments that about 20 years ago when, uh, when the laser interferometry, interferometer for gravitational wave observations, LIGO, uh, we, Australia was asked, or CSIRO was asked to be a part of that and put a small amount of funding towards that. And the government at the time said no. Uh, just two years ago they got the Nobel Prize. There's a few success stories that we've had, and again, I've picked out only a few uh, the success stories uh, for science funding, and I won't go too much into them, but one of them is from the ARC, the Australian Research Council, and I'm not going to go too much more into that because Andrea will take over there. Uh, but this is the Centre for Quantum Computation and Communication Technology. Australia is in, uh, in the race for quantum computers. There's an international race going on at the moment to make the first usable or useful quantum computer. A lot of people at the moment think that quantum computers is a solution looking for a problem, but these guys are the ones solving those problems. It's pretty exciting. There are a bunch of places around, just in Sydney, and that's just Sydney, trying to solve the problem of quantum computation. That will change the world, and we're a part of that race. Uh, and the ARC recognises that and gives, gives money to quantum computation. Again, not going to go too much into it because Andrew will talk about NHMRC, but this is a, a lovely, just a profile that they've got from their website. You can go and check out all the others. There's heaps of them. Uh, but this is Dr. Elizabeth Hodson who has funding into uh, renal diseases in Aboriginal children uh, and got a couple of hundred thousand dollars for that. This is really important stuff and it's a real success story when we can solve some problems, close gaps, etc. This is really important. Uh, CSIRO, another success story. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm denied about calling that a success story because this has had a, this investigator, HMS investigator, has had a lot of funding taken away from it. But this is one of the, excuse the pun, the flagships of CSIRO, where they're going out and doing uh, climate change research, Antarctic research to try and, uh, well, research to know more about what's going on in the oceans, what's going on in the climate. This is a fantastic ship, and it's really doing uh, punching above its weight for what we for what we pay for it. Uh, this is a, a, a nice, uh, a, a different uh, style of funding, so it's not government funding, but it's more like fundraising or, uh, or fundraising. Uh, we all know about uh, breast cancer research, and we know about fundraising because of the Pink Ribbon campaign. Everything's pink, you know, around Pink Ribbon time. Cricket players are pink, water bottles are pink, Tim Tams are pink, and we start talking about breast cancer research, which is insanely important. And as, oh, I've got my numbers here. And I need stats. So with breast cancer, in the year 2014, this is breast cancer here, we had a 30% improvement over about 30 years in survival rates of breast cancer because of the awareness and fundraising. This is gynecological cancer here, and we have only 9% increase in 30, in 30 years, right? There are reasons for that, you know, gynecological cancer is a bit of a taboo subject, um, but breast cancer used to be a bit of a taboo subject. So funding in research actually saves lives, but we know that. There are many problems with science funding, and again, this is going to be, get, get covered. Oh, I need my stats again. As of a couple of years ago, in federal parliament there are only 20 politicians who have had training in a discipline related to science. 7% um, of MPs, that's 11 out of 150, and 12% of senators, that's 8 of 76, um, have training in STEM related careers. And that's much below the amount of people graduating with, with uh, STEM qualifications, about 33%. Even that's on the decline, right? But that's the, the representation we have in politics is much lower than, than, what, we are, than what we have people uh, with, with science degrees. This is a real problem, and I don't need to say why. Here's another, I just think that's a funny slide. Here's another problem. We don't have a science minister. That's a bit of a problem. Uh, we don't see it, it's important, apparently, to give money to the government to represent scientists uh, across Australia. We, the best we can do is Minister for Jobs and Innovation. While that's great, we don't have a science minister. That's a pretty big problem, if you ask me. And this is one of my favourite words, uh, post-docalypse. 
The problem here is once you have uh, qualified scientists, there are not really any jobs for them in Australia. Around the world, it's difficult as a postdoc to get jobs. But mo a lot of the postdocs in Australia are going overseas to find jobs. There are fewer and fewer jobs for postdocs in Australia. And that's a big problem. But we might have a successful future if we think hard about it. Now, I've got a few question marks there because uh, this made me laugh. Um, we actually have an Australian Space Agency now, which is wonderful. There's a, a couple of million dollars being thrown at that. But their logo on their website looks to me as if it's been thrown together with cut and paste. This font is different to any other font that you'll find on the Australian government website. It's bigger, it's bold, it's a different font. It's really strange to me. So that's why I've asked the question, is it a successful future? Yeah, sure, we've got a, a, space, a space force. <laughs> a space agency. <laughs> But if we can't even get a logo right, like, I'm, I'm nervous about that. I'm really nervous about that. Also, I wonder where they got the idea for a space agency from. So we need people to start influencing us, uh, influencing uh, government, influencing the people who uh, fund science. And one of those places is a place like Questacon or education, teachers, universities, that sort of stuff. This is just a blanket kind of education, exciting people about it, getting us to talk about it. Like the breast cancer or gynecological cancer issue, we, we talk about it, people will eventually start funding it. So one of the places that we find influence is education. I'll, I'll finish up, but uh, one thing that I find is it's really exciting is that there is, you know, the, the vice chancellor of one of our universities, one of our top universities, in fact, by some metrics, the top university in Australia, is a scientist. Not only a scientist, a Nobel Prize winning scientist. That's, that speaks a lot. Like if our, if our top people in our top universities are scientists, that's a lot. Our Australian of the Year is a quantum researcher from the group that I men uh, mentioned before, the, uh, the group at UNSW. These top people in Australia, our most trusted people, are scientists. And I think that's pretty good. That, to me, tells us that we do value science, um, but I think we can value it with other things other than prizes. Uh, funding, for example. Oh, these are just a couple of other uh, inventions from, uh, from Australia. And I just want to finish with that one. That's just funny to me. <laughs> anyway, that's a really quick, brief outline of Australian funding in science. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's interesting to know that not many politicians have a degree in science or something like that, since they're arguably the ones that should be developing solutions to our big problems, you know, asking the right questions and then sorting out the correct answer at the end. But uh, hopefully we'll change that in the future. But uh, next, we're going to talk about money in politics and, well, money from politics, perhaps. Uh, and Andrea will be telling us about that today. Uh, Dr. Andrea Leong is an executive member of the Federal Science Party and the leader of the New South Wales State Branch. Uh, she studied biomedical science at Monash University in Melbourne, then worked in the Biointerface Engineering Group at Swinburne University. She moved to Sydney in 2011 to do a PhD on antibacterial surface coatings with the Brian Holden Vision Institute and UNSW. Andrea now works in microbiome research for small pharma, having seen collaborative bioscience from academic, not-for-profit not and industry perspectives. Andrea is interested in how this work is supported and whether we're doing it right. So her topic, science funding, is ours optimal? Andrea. Thanks, Aaron. Now, how does this work? Science, yes, all right, cool, thank you. So um, when we talk about science funding, numbers, big numbers, tend to get thrown around without perhaps regard for whether they're really truly being comprehended. So we hear things like oh, $2 billion announced for research infrastructure over the next 12 years, things like that. And that's great um, because that provides the stability that researchers need to make those um, big uh, discoveries. Um, and it also helps retain expertise when you've got funding that is pledged over a long period. For example, the CSIRO has had to drop a lot of staff recently. 
uh, in really specialised areas like oceanography and biodiversity research and you don't get another 10, 20, 50 jobs like that just popping up next door when that funding is dropped. So when that happens, those researchers either move into a different field, a different sector, or move overseas, and then that expertise is lost and not easily regained. That said, um, comparing science funding from year to year with you know these numbers that get talked about, um, it is difficult to really grasp whether we're funding science more or less from year to year and how we compare with other countries. So tonight I'm going to try to break so down some of those big numbers and hopefully leave you uh, with the confidence to talk about science funding and with an opinion as to whether we should be funding science more or less, hopefully not less. So this is not a story, this is just a collection of facts which is just as exciting. So the first thing I'll talk about is the first this first distinction in Australian R&D, research and development spending. Uh, who is doing the spending? Businesses actually do a lot of the R&D in Australia. Universities do a fair bit, not-for-profits do a little bit, and the federal government also does a fair bit of the R&D funding in Australia. So politicians will talk about increasing Australia's science funding, and when they do so, it can be a little bit dishonest because they'll talk about raising the overall science spend. Obviously the government can really only directly influence this portion, the government's spending. But the government can, that said, the government can create the right conditions for these other sectors, businesses, universities, not-for-profits, to, uh, to be comfortable and well supported to spend on R&D. Um, so, just speaking of how much these relative uh, sectors do spend, I'm going to ask for a show of hands here to yeah, audience participation. Uh, what percentage of the federal budget do you think the government spends on R&D? So the federal budget is about 480 million, sorry, billion dollars. And I'm going to ask if you think it's about 1%, 2%, 5% or 10% spent on R&D. Can I get a show of hands for 1%? 2%? 5%? Or 10%? Yeah, 10% would be pretty optimistic. It is actually 2%. Um, so we might think it's a little lower than it is. Uh, I saw a lot of hands go up for 1%. Um, actually, we're not that low on science spending. Sorry, what am I hitting here that's making the microphone? Is it that? No. Okay, 2% is what we spend on science. So for the visual learners here, science and not science. Okay, so how does the government divvy up this little sliver of science funding here, which amounts to about $10 billion? Uh, it goes through a lot of agencies, for example, the CSIRO, which we heard about. Um, you know, they've got a very diverse portfolio. There's more... Uh, uh, word, I was going to say concentrated, focused. Focused agencies like um, ARENA, the Renewable Energy um, Funding Agency, and ANSTO in uh, nuclear research. Uh, there's also the various government departments which uh, uh, portion up funding as they see fit towards R&D. And then there's the NHMRC and the ARC, which Tom briefly mentioned. So these are the bodies that fund grants that uh, researchers apply for. Uh, between them, the NHMRC, the National Health and Medical Research Council, and the ARC, Australian Research Council, which has a broader scope, between them they've got about a hundred, sorry, one and a half billion dollars of grant funding to divvy up. So at the moment, these, these agencies get a lot more applications than they're able to fund. So about half of the grant applications that come through are deemed worthy of funding, so they're good projects, but only about half of those can be funded because they just don't have enough money. So remember that one, about half of the projects that are deemed worthy can be funded and the rest just go unfunded, they miss out. I think I'll just also mention that when you've got funding by application, how 
those applications are assessed can bring a certain amount of bias into the sorts of funding, the sorts of science that gets funded. So we don't just look at the merit of the project, unfortunately, we also look at the track record of the researchers. And while having a good track record in gaining funding and being invited to speak at conferences as a keynote speaker and things like that, they do indicate a certain prowess in research, but it does tend to crowd out younger researchers, newer researchers who may have newer and innovative ideas. So I think we should be looking at these applications for funding purely on the basis of merit without regard to what those same researchers have been awarded in the past. All right. Um, so, I also just wanted to mention the R&D tax incentive here. So that's one of the ways that the government creates a, an environment for businesses to do R&D. It's not counted in that 2% uh, there because it's not um, an expense. It is revenue, tax revenue that is foregone. But I wanted to give credit where credit is due. It's pretty big. So that's about $3 billion of tax incentives that are given to businesses um, every year. Although it's, it's been increasing, so I think the government seeing this as a bit of a blowout, um, I think it's doubled in the last five years or so. I don't know if, James, you... They're, they're cracking down. Yeah, so there's a, um, some, what, if, what is it? New integrity standards that they're going to assess these projects a little bit more stringently. So the new integrity standards are a good thing. The R and maybe. The R&D tax incentive itself is a good thing. So credit where credit is due. Um, so that's how our federal government spends its approximately $10 billion on R&D every year. And now to look at this from year to year and compare with other countries, I'm going to have to now look at it in a little bit of a different way. So on the last chart slide, I showed you the federal budget. Oh, here it is again. Remember this guy, the, uh, the federal budget here, science and not science. So now we're going to look at the science spend as a proportion or as a percentage of GDP. So gross domestic product or GDP is a measure of all the monetary value of the goods and services produced by a country. It's not a good measure of the, necessarily a good measure of the health of an economy or of the, uh, the, um, the satisfaction with life that maybe everyone has in the country, but it is, what we're looking at here is funding, and that's exactly what it's good for measuring. So the GDP includes the federal budget, so the federal budget is a subset of GDP, and this is the science spend uh, as a proportion of GDP. So this here is the government proportion uh, with its little science sliver, and here's the rest, all of the non-government, non-government spending and this little, little bit here is the uh, R&D spending by sectors other than government. So business, charity and university science funding is this wedge here. So it's interesting to note that the proportions are fairly similar. That's also about 2% of the entire GDP is R&D funding from all sectors. So that kind of mirrors the 2% funding uh, of government spending as uh, a proportion of the federal budget. Okay, so um, is that clear? This is really, uh, yeah, um, a difficult topic to get your head around sometimes. So um, what has it been historically if we're sitting on about 2% now? Well, it's been, it, it changes a little bit and unfortunately where we are now, this is 2014-15, but it hasn't changed much in the last few years. It's been higher. It hasn't really been lower than where we are now for the last 40 years, so that's a little bit disappointing. So given the, the difference from here at 0.55% to 0.7%, we really, if we wanted to, we could pull that funding from elsewhere and fund science as we have in the past, if we wanted to, that's just a decision. So um, other countries do it. Where do we sit in the, uh, in the ranking? So looking at the Australian spend on R&D, this is the federal government spend. Now you'll notice this 
is ABS data and it says uh, we spent 5.5% on uh, funding. This is 0.4%, so it's a little bit different. But uh, it wouldn't change our ranking very much either way. So we'll just go ahead with this. So federal expenditure on uh, government expenditure on R&D, we rank really quite low um, compared to other OECD countries. But when you look at the overall spending, um, including industry, so the private spending as well, we move way up the ranking. So what this shows us here is that Australian businesses are picking up the slack, putting us in about the middle of the pack. Um, I just want to point out here that South Korea is up here spending about twice as much, right, twice as much, remember that, as we are, okay. Um, and I also want to point out that when business is picking up the slack, you can also get a bias to the type of research that's being done because they'll be looking for those short-term gains, which is great. That's an important part of the picture and um, it is important to have these collaborations between academia and industry because sometimes academics are the last person in the world who should be commercialising their own research, which is fine, again. Um, yeah, but businesses do tend to focus on that research that has a short-term return, so the opposite of moonshots, basically. So, um, let's take a closer look at a few other select countries um, in their R&D spending. So here's Australia's spend, higher education here and the business spend, which um, I think I mentioned before is the biggest proportion of science spending. Here's the government in grey and that little tiny sliver of not-for-profit spending, um, making up our science spend. So, I mean, we could be pessimistic and say we've seen a little bit of a decline in the last uh, 10 years, but I think... Uh, optimistically we can say this is stagnating, we can recover from this. New Zealand, I just put in there because I like New Zealand, they're, see how, notice that their government and their higher education spends are maybe similar to ours, but their business sector spends a lot less. It'll be interesting, this is um, only a data up to 2015, so that'll be interesting to see if that increases as their space agency and space industry takes off, no pun intended. So we can, this is uh, where Australia is at, around the 2% of GDP mark. Um, Israel is a huge R&D spender uh, with about 4% of their GDP being spent on R&D and almost all of that is taken up by business. So government um, has very little of the R&D spend in Israel, but that just shows that it can be done. Are they a special case? Korea as well, um, mentioned them on the last slide. They've increased, they've doubled their science funding in the last uh, 18 years. So I think that goes to show that it can be done uh, if we want. And in Korea, um, um, as opposed to Israel, government has come along for the ride or perhaps been supporting that rise. So could Australia do it? Here is the Science Party's anti-mascot. Whenever we say we want to double science funding, that's what we want to do, someone says, but who's going to pay for it? Well, if the question is where are we going to pull $10 billion from other budget items, then the answer is straightforward. We can pull that from uh, perverse tax incentives. They've got the capital gains tax discount, um, other incentives for big business. Um, we've got fossil fuel subsidies that we should not be paying. Um, but is that really the right question to be asking? So in the Science Party, we want to ask the right questions so we get useful answers, good quality answers. So the question in this case should be, what is the return on science spending? Who indeed is going to pay for it? Maybe we don't need to pay for it at all. So here's a, a quote from the CSIRO annual report from 2016-17. The estimated present value of benefits from CSIRO's work is approximately $3.2 billion per year. This is almost three times the total annual CSIRO budget. So great, there's some new information. The return seems to be about three times on the amount that we put in. We get three times back. Great. Uh, but that's only one data point. Can we find anything else? Relative to the funds committed to the CRC program, that's the Cooperative Research Centres, 
which are col collaborations between industry and universities. Relative to the funds committed to the CRC program by the Australian Government, the CRC program has generated a net economic benefit to the community which has exceeded its costs by a factor of 3.1. So there's that number again. So I think we're starting to maybe feel pretty confident this is um, a good estimate of the return that we can get on governmental uh, science funding about three times. And this is from 2012, so that holds true. That's great. So. I think it's time we can probably act on this and start to put more money into science funding to reap those rewards, look at it as an opportunity rather than a cost. But what's this? There is a high correlation between the wealth of nations in terms of gross domestic product per capita and research and development intensity. Great, another data point. This is from 1997 from a paper written by a parliamentary staffer who's done a lot of really interesting research. And this was 20 years ago. So we've been sitting on our hands all this time. So that's, that's pretty mind-blowing negligence when you think about it, that we know that science and research is a, it's a positive effect on the national budget, and yet we just, we just haven't been doing it. I, I don't understand why. So um, that is why the Science Party wants to double research funding. That'll take us to being among the top science funding nations in the world and though all of those applications for grants that were deemed worthy will be able to be funded. So um, I'm just going to finish on science party policy. So in addition to doubling research funding, we want to ensure that we have a Minister for Science and Research along with a Minister for Innovation and in Industry. It's absurd that this should need to be said, but uh, we're now in the second period in the last five years that we have not had a dedicated science minister. We do have a, an assistant minister for science to the minister for industry. So, um, yeah, absurd, but turns out it does need to be said. Um, so we have some priority areas here. Um, they're pretty broad. I think it's important to have some broad areas to make sure that we don't um, miss out on huge sectors um, in terms of what gets research funding and what doesn't. But some of the announcements made by the government are very specific. Things like the National Carp Control Plan. Um, I, I would not doubt the, in, uh, the advice of experts from, say, the Invasive Animals Cooperative Research Centre if they say we need to reduce the number of carp in the Murray-Darling system. But I think that should be left to them and not announced as a static government priority. So I think that it has the potential to undermine some confidence in the, uh, the, the way the government allocates funding if they are announcing some very, very specific areas like this. So that's why we stick to these broad priority areas. So as well as funding for research, um, we've got to take a holistic approach and nurture the science industry both from the top down and the bottom up. So. That includes, for example, we have our space policy, which Tom touched on. And uh, number one was establish a space Australia, uh, an Australian space agency. Done. So I'm not saying that it was us that did it, but I, I'm just saying we had a space agency policy and now we have a space agency. <laughs> Other points in our policy are to incentivise Australian space infrastructure, and that is uh, facilities for launching satellites, which is a huge opportunity area that we could move into and also to undertake a space innovation and growth strategy study. So we're coming to the end of our decadal plan for science planning and it would do us well to have a coherent plan for space research into the next 20 years. And um, again, something that Tom touched on is our education policy. So we want to make sure we have plenty of young people interested in science and technology uh, into the future. So we want to make sure STEM is, <laughs> <laughs> science is hilarious. Um, uh, that includes strong STEM education at the primary and secondary levels, including um, computer programming from a young age, because scientists of all stripes are going to need that sort of skill in the future. Um, I'm a biologist, I find myself lacking because now we generate so much more data than we used to. 
so much more quickly. So computer programming is a skill that's uh, going to be very much needed by scientists of all stripes and affordable tertiary education as well. Uh, we've recently had the government uh, reducing the um, income level at which graduates have to repay HEX. Now, if people are not paying back their HEX because they don't have anywhere near the median wage, I think the solution is not to make them poorer. The solution is to create more incentives, sorry, not more incentives, um, an environment uh, within the economy that can accommodate them. So as, again, I uh, mentioned earlier, we've got more PhD graduates than we have positions for those PhD graduates. Um, and this is, yeah, it's a holistic strategy to make sure we have lots of people interested in science and lots of science jobs for these people to go into and support the science industry from all angles. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. It's interesting that Israel has such a high percentage of their GDP as science funding. They describe themselves as under constant existential threat. So for them to throw that much money means that there must be something behind it and we should be doing the same thing. So next we have James. James Jansen is the leader of the Science Party. He grew up in Sydney's West and is the eldest of six children. He studied mathematics and later teaching at the University of Sydney. He did a short stint teaching at a disadvantaged school in Western Sydney. Since then, James has completed his PhD in mathematical modelling of HIV disease progression and epidemiology. He's the founder of two startups, Tapview and XCredits, both of which are in the fintech space. And today he'll be talking about what is a moonshot and what moonshots could we do, James? So uh, to begin with, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the history of moonshots. And for this, well, I, I'll, I'll define the moonshot. This is, uh, I think, is what was on Wikipedia. But a moonshot in a technology context is an ambitious, exploratory, groundbreaking project undertaken without any expectation of near-term profitability or benefit, and also, perhaps, without a full investigation of potential risks and benefits. So this is like risk. This is all about risk. This is putting money behind things which are uh, out there uh, and exciting and potentially have a, a huge payoff, but ones which are hard to calculate in the short term. And I'll give a few examples of uh, this. So. This is the OG moonshot, like the literal moonshot. So this uh, happened in July 20, uh, 1969. Um, and what's really crazy about that is it was announced by JFK in September of 1962. So that was like seven years, and they went from not being on the moon to being on the moon. So imagine if we were to like, say in 2010, Australia would be on the moon in seven years. That would be you know, people would say that that's ridiculous, but that's exactly what the United States did with no prior technology having, well, no prior human beings going to the moon. Um, what's really interesting about this, though, is unfortunately there was a lot of political change in there, uh, partially uh, kicked off by JFK being assassinated, uh, and then uh, President Johnson, he was in uh, power until 1969. Uh, and then uh, Nixon, President Nixon kind of took all the credit. Um, but you can see that despite the fact that this is actually a very short timeline, there's still a lot of political change, you know, change of presidents, uh, change of party that's in power. Uh, it's, it's a big change. And one of the reasons why I think a lot of uh, politicians are resistant to think about these really out there long-term uh, funding projects. So this graph here is uh, a graph of what the Americans spent on their uh, space agency, uh, NASA, and it was absolutely enormous. So you could see here it's 4.5% uh, of the federal budget, which is absolutely enormous. Like when, when you think about us spending 2% uh, of our federal budget uh, on all science, all science that we ever did, you know, they spent more than twice as much 
uh, putting people in spaceships and landing them on another celestial body. Um, so if, if we were to do, um, yeah, so this is a percentage of the federal budget. If we were to compare that to our federal budget, which is $450 billion per year, 5% is $22.5 billion per year. So the cost would be like $1,000 for every person in Australia, approximately. So imagine, you know, you have a household of five people and you're spending, uh, you know, like 100 bucks a week. Like you're missing out on government benefits of $100 per week or road improvements of $100 per week or all of these things that you get from the government, they put that much into their space agency. And it was an absolutely massive amount of money. And uh, I think, I'm, I'm not sure that if I were elected, I would spend that much money uh, on a single project. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think that it, it shows that you can put money behind things and have massive payoffs. And uh, NASA is a great example of that. Uh, so the qualities of moonshots that I like to point out basically are that they're large cost, large scale. Um, their impact is uh, exponential, potentially, but an enormous uh, impact. Uh, and it has highly uncertain outcomes. So to start off with, I'll focus on the large cost. Um, when you look at uh, some of the big recent projects, the, the bigger uh, moonshots, you have the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, that's uh, $9 billion. And that uh, is famous for observing the Higgs boson, which is, you know, a very, very important uh, step in uh, particle physics. Uh, but that was an enormous amount of money and it required the collaboration of multiple nations in order to do it. Uh, this one here, the ISS, uh, was, uh, I mean, it's been up there for a long time and it's due to come down not too long from now. Uh, but this is a massive international collaboration between the United States, Russia and various other countries. Uh, there's been an enormous amount of research that's gone on in there and uh, the scientific capabilities, but also diplomatic uh, capabilities that that provided to the world were very beneficial. Uh, but this is the kind of cost that uh, moonshots could cost, basically. Um, next one is large scale. So if you look at uh, Fermilab, this is, this is a uh, particle accelerator. Um, it has a circumference of 6.4 kilometers. Um, this is enormous. Like these uh, experiments that they're doing, they're, they're not one person in a lab, uh, you know, working by themselves. This is the work of probably thousands of engineers, construction workers, and scientists all working together to come up with uh, this one research apparatus which is used to do particle uh, experiments. Uh, so big science, I mean, this, this uh, trend of big science, it, it came after, uh, I guess, the World War. And we were looking at um, the post-war industrialization of science because we could do things uh, more uh, easily at a large scale. Uh, we had governments who were all uh, invigorated by having to fight a common em enemy. Um, you know, multiple countries had taxation changes. Australia was one of them. We, we had change to our taxation system, which created uh, an increase in federal government taxation. Um, so there's all this uh, capacity, but nowhere to put it. And, and one of these uh, industrializations that happened, in addition to things like education, was the industrialization of science. So uh, the next point is about a large impact. What, what's the exponential impact of some of these uh, discoveries? So what they can do is they can greatly improve our understanding of the universe. Uh, and you can see a lot of that in terms of uh, theoretical physics and other uh, chemical and physical uh, experimentation. They can improve our quality of life. So they could uh, drastically reduce disease, increase longevity, uh, increase our wealth. They can also uh, inspire a new generation of scientists. So if you've got uh, these large scale uh, experimentation, uh, experiments going on, these large scale projects, 
uh, people get inspired by them. We don't really have this in Australia because <laughs> all we have is uh, Questacon. Um, but in the United States, you have Space Camp. Do you know how awesome Space Camp is? It's like inspiring all the kids to go out and learn about space and think about science and how amazing it is to be a scientist. Uh, these projects, uh, they, they have flow-on effects in terms of uh, encouraging people to think about the impact that science has on the world. And uh, the large impact uh, of, of some of these studies uh, and experiments is that they can be built upon for uh, further exploration and discovery. So the space race that put us on the moon uh, had further impacts in terms of the kinds of things that we put into space, GPS, uh, the International Space Station, further uh, probes that, that went out further into the uh, solar system. So we can build on that original knowledge that we gained from those projects and go bigger and better. Some examples of some of these I'm going to pull out. Edward Jenner. Uh, so yeah, smallpox killed 400,000 Europeans a year, um, which is enormous. A, a huge amount of people were being killed. You know, this is the size of uh, cities at the time. Um, and uh, it was increasingly a problem, both, both in Europe, but also across the whole world. He developed a smallpox vaccine in 1796. Uh, he was a bit of a biohacker. He infected people with cowpox in order to build up the immunity uh, and, and prevent people from getting it. Uh, and effectively, we got rid of smallpox. Um, and that's half a million people, and possibly more if we still had it these days, who were being saved from getting uh, smallpox. Um, that is pretty enormous in terms of the, the impact uh, that it's had. Uh, we actually have a lot of things that still kill us. In fact, all people still currently die. Um, so if we could uh, do some more research into other health areas, maybe we could reduce, well, save even more lives. Uh, some of the other uh, large impacts I'd like to talk about, uh, Einstein, uh, he uh, invented quite a few things, including special relativity. He did some work in quantum physics, specifically the photoelectric effect. Uh, and he did uh, general, general relativity later on. Uh, the impact of his work is not really measured in terms of lives saved, but the uh, foundations of his work uh, are fundamental to things like solar technology, microchips, you know, so think about all the computer technology that we have right now, um, GPS, and a lot of the work that he did is so far out there that we're only just starting to use it now in an everyday sense. So the, the total impact of his work is absolutely enormous. If we can do genetic analysis at a rate of, you know, uh, well, it cost me $100 to do my DNA sequencing from 23andMe, and that's due to, uh, uh, due quite a bit in, due to like computer science, microchip development. So the impact that he had uh, in his theoretical work has, and, and physical experimentation has had an enormous amount of impact uh, across the world, including in medicine. It's very hard to measure though. So what, what is, for the amount of money that we put into his work, which is actually quite small, what's the total impact that he's had? Um, absolutely enormous. Um, the last point that I'd like to talk about in this section is about the highly uncertain outcomes. So we uh, sometimes struggle when we're talking about uh, what the payoffs are in science. Um, we can't always tell ahead of time how successful our research is going to be because of different types of uncertainty. Uh, so if you did some research into cancer, you know what the outcome is going to be if you're successful. Um, you cure cancer. That's fantastic. Um, but you don't know how long it's going to take you and you don't know how much it's going to cost. So you uh, have this ambition um, to do something, but you have potentially a very large unknown uh, cost to doing it. Um, on the next point, physics, you have a very unclear outcome. Who knows what physics 
that's being done today and the you know theoretical and experimental uh, you know uh, physics laboratories around the world which ones are going to have direct uh, payoff to our society that will impact our quality of life that will uh, allow us to explore the stars uh, we don't know which one of them are which which one of those will be used in the future so we don't know uh, we all don't know what the total cost is, but we also don't know what the uh, outcome will be. So it becomes very, very uncertain. The final point about um, this sort of funding is uh, it's very unclear when you should do some things. Uh, and that's because there are certain innovations that allow you to do uh, your experiments a lot more quickly. So if you come up with uh, massively improved uh, computer technology, then you can do certain types of experimentation much more easily. And so if you put a lot of money into certain types of uh, science too early on, then you might end up spending a lot more money than if you put money into more theoretical or computational areas and, and then left that until later. So it's very hard to tell um, whether it's the right time to do things and how long you should wait for the right type of technology to exist before you do that next set of experimentation. Some of the fields that I think uh, qualify for moonshots include mathematics, physics, uh, medical science, uh, large-scale transportation systems, so if we wanted to put uh, massive railway, high-speed railway systems in, across the world, you know, uh, that would be a large cost, large benefit, um, potentially unknown economic benefit. Uh, but uh, that's another moonshot type uh, project. Computational research, so computer science and, and new chips, including uh, things like quantum computing, AI research, integrated circuit research, uh, yeah, I kind of covered, covered that, uh, interplanetary uh, travel and energy research. But I'll go into a couple of these, which I think are interesting. I'm a purveyor of uh, out there ideas in general, and I want to talk about some of them. Uh, actually, I may have, I'm gonna skip over that. All right, um, so in Australia, these are the things that kill us the most. So uh, a lot of heart disease, dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, so we, we have uh, quite a few people who are dying uh, per year in these fields. And it looks very similar in terms of uh, worldwide mortality. Once again, you've got a lot of heart disease and stroke, uh, pulmonary disease. You, all of these uh, sorts of uh, heart and uh, vascular diseases are very uh, important in terms of mortality. Um, so. Imagine if you took drones, <laughs> and they're, they're getting pretty popular right now, and you have a lot of people who are uh, dying of heart disease, heart attacks, uh, and one of the things that's the, the biggest determinant uh, in terms of survivability is actually uh, the time until you reach uh, first aid, like primary uh, care, and then the time to get to emergency. Imagine if you got these drones, and when someone called up Triple O and said, hey, uh, my friend's having a heart attack, uh, you put one of these on them and you flew the automatic emergency defibrillator to the location. It goes there much more quickly and uh, you can, while the person's still on the phone or potentially communicating over the device itself, uh, give them instructions on how to use it and save that person's life. Uh, you could do this with a whole heap of other medical supplies, but this is a, a particularly uh, good uh, example of how you could save people's lives uh, very quickly. These devices are actually uh, considered to be so important that you can actually see them around a lot of uh, buildings uh, around the city. Uh, they actually have them in the lobbies. Uh, so if you, yeah, it's a good idea. If you're in the building, you might be able to save a life yourself, work out where the AED is, and uh, if someone's having a bit of trouble, um, run down get it and hopefully save their life. Uh, but if we could get that to everyone's house, everyone's workplace, maybe we could save even more. Um, on that same topic, uh, 
if you've got a lot of people who have heart disease, maybe you could make them a new heart. And this is the sort of thing that's actually happening right now, but I actually think that we're putting way, way, way too uh, small of an amount of money to actually get a payoff in terms of 3D organ printing anytime soon. And when we're literally having tens of thousands of people in Australia and millions worldwide dying of heart disease, I think that this should be considered like um, a solution to an international emergency in terms of mortality. Um, if we could 3D print uh, heart muscles and have for each person a backup heart ready to go. Uh, so when you uh, end up getting heart disease and you need a new heart, you can simply have one pre-installed without um, having to have a heart attack first. Once you get this to scale, um, it's actually going to be really, really cheap, like extraordinarily cheap. And we, at the moment, um, I mean, even if you weren't going to do this in a personalized way, there's lots of people who are on uh, waiting lists for things like heart and lung transplants. So if we could spend a bit of money 3D printing organs, we possibly could save a lot of lives. Uh, one thing that I like to go on about, um, I'm in fintech, but I also love this, which is bin tech. Uh, so this is an example of what I'm calling radical waste recovery. And the idea is you have rubbish and you throw it out. And one of the big problems with it is that uh, it all gets mixed in together. It's very hard to separate. It's very expensive to separate. There's a lot of humans involved in the process. Uh, and that means a lot of the stuff which is not commercial uh, to recover ends up just going into landfill. If we could have a system that is uh, using machine learning and uh, cameras and rob robotic arms to sort that rubbish, we could drastically reduce the amount of rubbish that goes to landfill and also reduce the amount of new material that we need to take out of the environment by recycling what we've uh, thrown away. So uh, this sort of uh, technology uh, machine learning and uh, computer vision and robotics. It, it's not just for the tip though. So you could take this to the ocean. And there's a lot of stuff which is going out there about like, we've got this like constant hole where it's dragging water through and it's like, I, I can't imagine it's environmentally uh, sustainable, but people trying to clean up the ocean and the great Pacific garbage patch and all that kind of stuff. If we could get machines that could use computer vision to go out and work out whether that thing floating on the surface is a plastic bag or a jellyfish and take it out selectively, then we could just deploy heaps of these machines to clean up our oceans. We could put them on the streets to clean up rubbish and, and throw out the bush to identify invasive species and, and get rid of those. So there's a huge opportunity in terms of uh, computer, uh, computer vision AI and robotics that we could use to solve pretty much one of the biggest environmental problems that we have right now. Um, the, the final thing that I'd like to talk about in terms of bin tech is uh, we could be mining our uh, landfill. So with a, the ability to separate waste uh, in a precise and cost-effective manner, we could start recovering some of the metals, uh, chemicals, plastics uh, from landfill and put them to good use and potentially prevent things like uh, wastewater seepage uh, from destroying our water tables, etc. A topic that's near and dear to my heart is mathematics. And I don't think that we talk enough about mathematics and how important it is. It's very hard to uh, explain to people how important it is to fund mathematics because it's so far away from touching the consumer. You, between mathematics and the consumer, you've got mathematics, physics, engineering, uh, commercialization and then marketing and between the start and the end you know in the case of uh, Albert Einstein and the photo uh, photovoltaic effect photo no I'm saying this wrong photoelectric effect oh dear yes yeah, so this 
physics grad right here, right? <laughs> um, it's, uh, you're talking about a time span of more than 60 years between it being described to actually being in use and another uh, you know, 20 or so years before actually he's starting to really use it at scale. Um, so the idea that there's mathematics behind that uh, is, is just so uh, disconnected from our understanding of what these products are that uh, it's hard to convince people that we should put money towards uh, mathematics. If uh, you go to this YouTube uh, channel, it talks about all the different types of mathematics that there are. And I think it's a, a very good, uh, you know, top level introduction into uh, various things that might interest you in mathematics. Some of them uh, include mathematical physics, mathematical chemistry. You have uh, control theory, which is very important to engineering. You have uh, statistics, which is actually a, a relatively modern invention. Our statistical methods really kind of sucked up until uh, the 1980s uh, and uh, continuing to develop. Um, it, it's kind of uh, the mathematics that a lot of mathematicians don't like, but it's also the mathematics that a lot of experimenters don't like. And I think uh, without statistics, uh, we would be uh, very far behind in terms of our experimental uh, outcomes. Uh, we've got cryptography, uh, computer science, machine learning. Uh, we have uh, a whole heap of other ones in here. Um, differential geometry over there and uh, calculus. Everyone knows calculus. Uh, you know, who would have thought some equations invented in the 1700s would give us so many things like uh, the ability to build enormous buildings and bridges uh, and do things like go to the moon. Um, but that's what 300 year old mathematics can do for us. And if we can do more of that, hopefully we could go a little bit faster and, and discover more about the universe. Uh, one thing that is a science party policy and uh, something that's kind of dear to my heart, not because I think it should be the only thing that we should invest in, but because I think it's something that we should at least contribute to in a meaningful way is fusion power. Uh, we are uh, totally capable of doing fusion on Earth. Um, and, and this is an example of, it, it's the National Ignition Facility. Uh, it's not a moonshot, it's, <laughs> it, it's a particle shot. We shoot lots of stuff together and then we hope that um, we generate some energy from that. So we're shooting uh, hydrogen nuclei together and trying to get them to fuse together. And we can do that. The problem is that we take a lot more energy to do it than we get out of it at the moment. But if we can increase the scale uh, and change the way that we can do that, possibly we could get positive energy out. And if we could do that, we have effectively unlimited energy in comparison to any sort of scale of energy that we've had so far. So massive environmental uh, benefits in doing, well, discovering fusion. It could help us uh, solve our on Earth problems, but also allow us to go uh, into space. Uh, and this is uh, talking about going into space, uh, colonizing the moon. Um, now, everyone's talking about colonizing Mars. And I think that that's kind of a noble cause, but I think that we should go to the moon first. And uh, the reason why we should go to the moon first is because it's closer, it's easier. We know uh, how to do it. It's um, really good because it uh, has no atmosphere and uh, it has, well, it's an enormous body of uh, resources and we can mine it. So if we went and we colonized the moon and we started mining the moon, we could collect resources without damaging the environment, the natural environment on Earth. Uh, it, one of the advantages is it's already in outer Earth orbit. So if you wanted to shoot stuff off the moon, um, it's already got all of that momentum. Um, and uh, the moon is very, very small uh, in comparison to the Earth. So you need a lot less energy to get off the moon. So you could, uh, rather than build all your spaceships here on Earth and then shoot them over to Mars, uh, if you could build 
uh, you know, maybe the human transportation components to take you to the moon um, on Earth. And then from the moon, you have the other thing that you're going to send over to Mars, sent over that way. Um, you could save a lot of energy and resources in doing so. Um, yeah, the cool thing about the moon is it's actually, it's traveling faster than the Earth 50% of the time as well in relation to the galaxy. Um, so, because it's rotating around the Earth. So, there are times at which we can get a much bigger slingshot effect off the moon uh, than we can get off the Earth with the same amount of energy. Uh, the other thing which is like a classic of science fiction, um, people love drawing these things and talking about them, um, but they're completely impossible on Earth, is mass drivers. What they are is, uh, it's a magnetic railway, basically. You take your uh, object that you want to fire, it could be a spaceship or maybe a, a lump of ore or a metal that you want to take off the planet uh, or the moon, and you shoot it. And you shoot it, instead of using chemical rockets, you use uh, magnetism and electricity. And the cool thing about that is you can use solar energy to do that. So it's very, very efficient, uh, and you can get to escape velocity off the moon's surface without uh, having left the atmosphere. You don't have to worry about drag and all those other kinds of things that make it very, very expensive energy-wise uh, in terms of getting off the Earth. So um, that is a moonshot. And I think it'd be really awesome if that became like the moonshot that humanity, one of the moonshots that humanity as a whole aimed for instead of Mars. Um, I think that uh, it's a little bit of a shame that the main people who are talking about exploring the universe are Elon Musk and um, Jeff Bezos. Like, why are they the two, the, the main two people who are talking about exploring the universe? Not to say that they're doing anything wrong. I think it's fantastic that they're doing that. But where are our political leaders who are saying, like, let's go out there. Let's discover things. Let's explore the universe. There's no one doing that uh, except for the science party, I guess. Um, so how do we make Australia a moonshot nation? Uh, firstly, I think we have to try a lot harder to inform people about the benefits of science. We have to get out there and really, really promote when uh, science does good. Uh, and it happens a lot, but it goes under the radar. And I think we need to work out how we can crack this uh, media system, which is really, really focused on things which are not fantastic. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about identity politics currently. And I think that that is, uh, important, uh, but it's not so important that it should be the only thing that we talk about. And we need to work out how we can uh, crack the media system and, and use the kind of tools that uh, the identity politics on both the left and the right use to get themselves to the forefront of media. If we can work out how to do that with science to help advance humanity instead of fight amongst ourselves, that would be a fantastic thing to do. Um, I think that we should build a culture of science being fundamental to our society. So we need to uh, make people understand that uh, everything that we have is due to technological advance and scientific advance. And if we can do that, um, we can encourage people of, of all sorts to think positively of science. So when we do things like we talk about um, English and other languages, uh, fundamental to the ability of the masses to read and write was the invention of the printing press and even more so the invention of the mobile phone. Everyone loves to talk about, you know, Generation Z and millennials, oh, they're always on their phones. It's like, as a teacher, when I was a teacher, I used to love it because they were reading and writing more than any other generation previously. Um, and that was thanks to the increase in availability of technology. Um, so if we can like communicate that idea that so much of our society is actually uh, based on science, we'd do well. Um, I think that we need to make uh, science part of our political conversation. So obviously we need to tell everyone uh, that making decisions based on uh, scientific research and the outcomes uh, based on that 
I, I think that we need to always refer back to that and, and hold ourselves to that uh, level of criticism as well. So when we uh, have opinions uh, or assumptions that are, turn out to be incorrect, uh, we need to admit that um, we weren't right. Um, but that's like a win for the science party if we do that, because we can say, we made this opinion based on this, and now we admit that we're wrong. And uh, that was based on science as well. So uh, I think the more we can take opinion out of the argument, and put in more science and more facts into the argument, the, the better it is for everyone. And um, the last thing I'd like to talk about is uh, don't afraid, be afraid to be dreamers. Uh, I think it's really hard to be a, a dreamer in the modern world. Like the idea of uh, doing things like uh, going into space, it's super like daggy and frowned upon. When, when I started the science party, which was called the Future Party, uh, we had some out there ideas. And, and one of them was uh, we should legalize driverless cars and get the technology here quickly so that we could save people's lives. And we had people telling us that it was impossible and it was a pipe dream. Uh, and uh, it was really uh, disheartening to get that obviously, as a, a person who is promoting these ideas and trying to get this information out there. Um, the same was true of things like uh, our public transport plan and our plan to, to build new cities and, and think about uh, the way that we build cities differently. Um, people really uh, were quite negative, but I think that we need to just uh, break through that and don't be afraid to be dreamers because if we give up on those out there ideas which um, have uh, a bit of uh, risk to them, but a lot of promise, um, we won't have anything good to say uh, and we'll get stuck in stagnation. So we should go out there and really, really, really promote the idea that we should back uh, out there uh, scientific uh, and technological projects so that we can advance humanity. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much.